Hello and welcome. We are on chapter four of Genesis. Today we're going to be talking about Cain and Abel. Why is it that God looked favorably on one offering versus the other? Why? We're going to talk about that. Uh, we're also going to talk about jealousy, which we definitely do see, which leads to murder. Uh, other topics on that realm that we're going to talk about, incest and polygamy, although uh, both of those things uh, aren't even really discussed in this chapter, but they are elements that exist in this chapter that we're going to talk about. Uh, lots to cover, uh, so bow your heads and let's get into this. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, this time that we have. I pray that you will be here, speak through me and that you will uh, bless this word and, and have it be fruitful in our ears and our minds. We dedicate this time to you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Genesis chapter 4. I'm going to break this up into several chunks. We're going to do verse 1 through 7, uh, and then talk about that. And then we're going to do 8 through 16. Uh, and then 17 through 24, and then finish off with verse 25 and 26. So uh, let's start with uh, verse 1 of Genesis 4. Adam made love to his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave, gave birth excuse me, to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of the time, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So we have uh, the first two brothers on earth, Cain and Abel. Uh, Abel kept flocks, he was a shepherd, and Cain worked the soil, he was a farmer. Cain brings some fruit of the soil, a, a, a grain offering, uh, or it could have been um, fruit from a fruit tree, but um, the, the, the word literally is, uh, uh, the, the offering is often used as a grain offering, is the word that was used. And then you have Abel bring uh, fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. So why does God look favorably on Abel's offering and not on Cain's? Well, it's obvious simply because God loves meat and he hates vegetarians. I can't even say that with a straight face. Uh, out of context, you, you could actually, uh, there is perspective that uh, God prefers a blood sacrifice. That is one perspective. Uh, and it, out of context, if you take Romans 14, 2, Paul says, one man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Context is everything. And that verse, I mean, you can find verses that, that argue that you shouldn't work out. You can find verses that say that you should eat only meat or that vegetarians are weak. Context of that, Paul is talking about something completely different. Uh, and just to explain it just real quick of what Paul is talking about there when he says one man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. This isn't a time uh, when Paul is writing to the Roman believers in which you have Jews that are converting to Christianity. Their entire life, they have only eaten kosher. They've never had bacon. They've never had pork chops. And they become Christians, and Jesus fulfilled the law. So, and, and specifically said that nothing that you eat makes a person 
uh, sinful, that, that, that you're, you're not made sinful by the things that you eat. You can eat whatever you want. And so there were Jews that still culturally had spent their entire life not eating pork and they just couldn't do it. They just couldn't do it because they, they had always been one way and it was just too weird and strange for them to go back. So Paul is simply saying, in front of that person, don't eat bacon, don't eat a pork chop because you have freedom and it doesn't mean that you should make those who, who are, are challenged by it um, struggle with it. And that is a very quick explanation of the context. God doesn't hate vegetarians. <laughs> Sorry, I was just having some fun with that. But there is actually a perspective out there that sees these two offerings as because there's no blood in uh, Cain's offering um, that for whatever reason um, that, that God preferred the offering that Abel did. No, the word that's used here is minha, minha, which that word means offering, and it applies to both Cain's offering and Abel's offering. Uh, we also see in Leviticus 2, 1, an example of a grain offering where it was just grain and there was no fat, there was no meat portion. Uh, and the idea is, is that it is an offering, a gift to honor. Um, it can be a grain offering, it could be a meat offering. Uh, the same word is used to describe both. So the question is then, then what is it? Well, we don't know. All we can learn from this is God's response and then Cain's response from what God says. And as you see this, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So there's two hypotheses that I wanna to propose to why Cain's offering was not looked on with favor. There's two possible solutions that, that, that are easy to come up with. One is that Cain did not give him his first fruits, the best of his flock, right? So Abel gave, specifically it says, the fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The idea here is that you give to God the very best at the very beginning. That's what the offering is. So Abel brought the firstborn sheep from his flock and the fat portion at that. It is the very best of the best of the newest that he had. It's the same idea as later on we're going to see this. Abraham is waiting his entire life for the fulfillment uh, of God's promise. Not his entire life, uh, but for like 25 years. He is waiting for God's fulfillment of his promise that he's going to be a great nation and he's going to have many descendants. And then finally, he has a son by his wife. And God tells him to sacrifice that son. And so he takes his son and goes to sacrifice him. The thing that he loves that he's been waiting for for so long. And right before Abraham actually kills his son, God says, Abraham, stop. We see your faith. We see where you're at. And God provides a ram in the thicket. God does provide the sacrifice so that Abraham doesn't have to kill his son. The point being is uh, Abel's sacrifice was the first fruit, the very best that he had, the first of his flock. So the question is, Cain's, was it not the best? Maybe Cain saved for himself uh, the very best wheat, but brought the wheat that was full of weeds or something else. It wasn't the best of the best, right? So he's being uh, greedy. The other thought is, is that maybe, maybe Cain did give the best of the flock, the best of his fruit, the best of the, the grain, so to speak, not flock, but the best of his grain, but he did it with a bitter heart. He did it with a bitter heart. So those are the, the two um, elements that could be there. With a bitter heart, he's doing it out of pride. Uh, he's, he's angry, he's doing it, but he's doing it because he feels he has to as opposed to wanting to. Now, to jump to modern day application, tithing. Tithing is a modern day application to this. Does God need your money? No, no. The whole point of tithing is a sacrifice of you honoring God with what he has given you. 
as you study tithing in scripture, the idea is, is that you give 10% before anything else. Your money comes in, you set aside 10% for the Lord because God has blessed you and you want the very beginning, the very first thing that you do with that money is to set it aside for God and give it back to him because it's all his money anyway. And when you do that, the Bible says you will be blessed. The Bible also says that if you're good with small things and few things, you'll be blessed with more. There's actually uh, th this idea that, that if you are a good steward with the small things, you will be blessed with more. And when you see a person, everyone is called to tithe. And we also see uh, instances where somebody who has very, very little giving just a few pennies and having that be more significant than a billionaire giving uh, $1,000 because of the sacrifice that they're making. So the point being here is where is your heart? Where is your heart with that offering? Are you like Cain where... You're giving, but you're only giving 20 bucks as the uh, offering bag goes by, and you, you, you're checked off the box there, but you're being greedy. You, you wanna keep it, you wanna keep it, so you're not giving the best, right? Or uh, are you giving because you feel that you have to? I actually just talked to somebody um, just this past week. This is, uh, I didn't even think about talking about this, but it just occurred to me. There's a church, and I'm not gonna name which one it is, it's not local here, that uh, somebody who watches these videos every week, uh, she emailed me and she said that, that there was a church that she was going to where at the end of every year, they, the church asked to see the tax returns, to see if, if their church congregants, their church members were actually tithing 10%. I have huge issue with that because the tithe is not something that the church enforces that you must do. It is something that is a get to, not a got to do. It is something that we do out of obedience, yes, but it is something that, that needs to be a gift out of the heart. And when you require it, you're no longer making it a gift that you are giving out of your heart. I'm gonna stop talking about tithing and I'm gonna stop talking about this chunk and we're gonna keep going. But the, the point being that we look at is that Cain clearly is either being prideful or greedy with his offering that he gives to the Lord. And because of that, God looks with favor on what Abel gives. He doesn't reprimand Cain that we see, but Cain gets angry. Cain gets angry. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not, if you do, not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. God knows what's about to happen. And let's continue reading verse eight. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the, the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you you will be restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. The Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So here we see the first premeditated murder. And I say premeditated uh, simply because of the verse uh, where Cain says to his brother Abel, Hey, Abel, let's go out in the field, man. He knew what he was doing. He planned on doing it. He was jealous of his brother and he made the decision to kill him takes him out in the field and kills him. Now, Deuteronomy uh, 1911, 
goes through the law and there's different elements of the law and there is a difference between what uh, we call um, the difference between first degree murder and manslaughter. So the, the differences between those is meditation. Whether you are accidentally killing someone or you are premeditating it, you're thinking it through ahead of time, you're planning it out. Deuteronomy 19, 11 and 12 says, but if out of hate, someone lies in wait, assaults and kills a neighbor, and then flees to one of these cities, the killer shall be sent for by the town elders, be brought back from the city, and be handed over to the avenger of blood to die. It's rather cryptic, uh, but if you want a full explanation, you can read all of Deuteronomy 19. So a couple different things in this. One, uh, these cities that if somebody lies in wait, assaults and kills a neighbor, then flees to one of these cities. Um, these cities is what's called a city of refuge. And the idea of a city of refuge is that if you accidentally kill somebody, and the example that's given in Deuteronomy is if you're chopping down a tree and the head of your ax flies off as you're chopping down the tree and kills your neighbor, that is an example of a situation where you would flee to a city of refuge. Uh, you wouldn't lose your life because you didn't mean to kill the individual, but you would go to one city that's set aside as a city of refuge. And then the avenger of blood, the avenger of blood is a family member, loved one, someone of significance of the person who's died, who, who is taking on the responsibility of avenging the death, right? So the avenger of blood uh, cannot go and take you from the city of refuge. But in this situation, it's saying if you do premeditate and lie in wait, then it's the right of that avenger of blood to bring you back to that town for trial and for them then to be able to execute you uh, for the crime that you did. So that is an example of what the, the Bible shows as uh, premeditation and the difference between manslaughter and first degree murder. There is a difference and we do see here um, first degree murder. It is planned, it is premeditated. Um, by Cain to kill his brother Abel. So here's a few questions uh, that, that as you go through this, the first time I read this, uh, excuse me, uh, when I read this earlier this week and prepping for this, there's some big questions that jump out just naturally as you read. First of all, um, when God says, uh, where is your brother Abel? In verse nine, at this point, there are four people on earth. Has God lost Abel? Let's back up actually to chapter three, verse nine, where God's walking through the garden and he asks uh, Adam and Eve, where are you? Has he lost the only two people on earth? No, when, when you read this, the asking of the question, he, this is the question for you to ponder is why does he ask that? And when does he ask that? Think about it for a second. In both instances, it's after the sin has happened. In uh, Genesis 3, it's after the fall. It's after the taking of the, the bite of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And then they're hiding wearing fig leaves, no doubt itching like crazy. It's after uh, they've committed the sin. And then you look at 4.9, and it's after Cain has killed Abel. And I would argue the where are you is more of a question not on the physical side. What have you done? Where are you at? Because you've departed from me. You have done something. Where are you at? What is happening? What's going on in you? And now to jump back to uh, application, the Holy Spirit resides in us as Christians. And that still small voice, um, I like, it, it's your knower is a weird way of saying it, but it's, it's how you know what is right and what is wrong. There, are, you know instantly when you've done something wrong. As a Christian, as a believer, uh, when you have a close relationship with God, it's, it's instant. You realize immediately afterwards, ah, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. And that's God calling you to uh, admit what you've done. And that's, that's the situation here, is the very first step um, to restitution is admitting what you've done. And Cain, we see where his heart's at. I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. You see Cain's heart is very clear. 
uh, um, deceitful, lying. Uh, he, he does not want to admit what he has done. Unfortunately, Cain misses the opportunity to be able to um, ask for forgiveness, to be able to return to God, to be able to repent. No matter how severe the sin is, God is always there. All you need to do is repent. Stop what you're doing and turn around, and God is there instantly. And we see, I believe, when he asks, where are you? It's, it's God giving an opportunity. It's the same idea as your conscious saying, what have you done? And you can either choose to have your conscious seared and not admit what you've done as being a, a sin or a fault, or you can realize it and admit it. Uh, so continuing on, um, we see actually a comparison between Adam and Eve and Cain. Uh, let, let me explain. So um, Adam gets kicked out of the garden, right? Adam is in this perfect horticultural environment. It's the Garden of Eden. Everything is growing perfectly. And because of his sin, he's kicked out. So now the land still will bear fruit to him, grain, etc. But he's got to till the ground. That's part of the, the um, by the, off the sweat of your brow, you will work the land for your food all the rest of your days. Well, in the same way, uh, after Cain murders his brother, God kicks him out. But in a, in, in a further aspect, it, it, it's the same idea, but it's even further and harsher in the sense that now the land that you had off the sweat of your brow would produce for you, now it's not even going to produce for you. Um, but we're also going to see in the same for um, Adam, God does take care of Adam and God does take care of Cain. Um, and I'll explain that in just a second. But verse 13 and 14, we see, we see Cain's response, which clearly just shows where his heart is at. Um, he immediately is saying that the, the, the punishment you've given me is way too strong. People are going to find me and they're going to kill me. Um, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land. I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. I mean, yeah, the punishment is pretty severe. Um, but here's a question. There's two questions that come to mind when you, you read this passage that, that just jump out to me. First of all, uh, who is Cain of afraid that's going to kill him? Think about it. Before he kills Abel, there's only four people on earth. So it's just Cain now and mom and dad, right? Well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that a little bit later, but it's an interesting question. Clearly not. Clearly not. Because of what Cain says here, uh, whoever finds me will kill me. Clearly there are other people on earth. And we're going to talk about that more. Uh, but the other question that jumps out is what's the mark that God puts on Cain, right? Is it something that you can physically see? Uh, and how then, if that's the case, did everybody know that that was a mark that God put on Cain not to touch him, not to kill him? Or I'm curious if it was a spiritual thing where people just wanted to stay away from him, that they just left him alone, and that would actually be further punishment if Cain was somehow denied social interaction on some level. I don't know. I don't know what the mark was, uh, but God does put a mark on Cain but this is similar to what we see with Adam, right? So Adam falls, uh, uh, he's naked, he makes the, the fig leaves, God sees him in his uh, bad state, and the, we see the first sacrifice where God kills an animal to be able to provide skins. And in that same way, God does show to Cain his provision and his love for him, that he does protect him from being killed by the other people that are there. It's just an interesting thought that even the sinners uh, who completely reject God, God still loves and God still does provide provision for them, and still cares for them. Okay, so um, verse 17 through 24, we get the lineage of Cain. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Arod, and Arod was the father of Mahalajah, and Mahajala 
uh, was the father of Methushel, Methushel, and Methushel was the father of Lamech. Now, I, I, I wrote down the, the pronunciations of these. I know I'm supposed to keep reading, but I just wanted to pause uh, and read these. So, um, Irad, uh, I-R-A-D, is pronounced Erod in the Hebrew, uh, and then the uh, Mehuyel, Mehuyel, we would say Mehujel, but the J is silent. So um, that's Mahuyel, and then uh, Methusheel, Methusheel is how you pronounce that, and then Lamech would be really <sighs> Lamech. Sorry, um, I know I butchered those, I don't speak Hebrew. Um, shameless plug right now for uh, Blue Letter Bible, a phenomenal app that you can go to, just blueletterbible.com, and you can do a search, and you can click on the verse, and then it'll, it'll actually bring up the Masoretic text, which is the original Hebrew, so you can actually see it, and you can click on the word, and um, a Hebrew scholar will actually read off the word of how it is actually pronounced. And despite listening to that some hours before uh, doing this study, I still uh, butcher it. So continue on in 19. Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raises livestock. His brother's name was uh, Jubal. He was the father of all who play string instruments and pipes. Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister uh, was Nahamaya. N excuse me. Neyama. Neyama. Uh, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. So we're going to stop right there and we're going to break a few of these things down. Um, one interesting note is that verse 18, the list of the names, we're going to see a similarity uh, in chapter 5 in the descendants of Seth. And I'll talk about that more next week. But there's, there's some things that uh, jump out almost instantly. Instantly. Cain made love to his wife. I just said, I mean, it, the Bible at this point has not said that Adam and Eve have had other kids. And yet, Cain made love to his wife. Who is his wife? Wh where did she come from? That's a, a very logical question. There are two options. Option number one, God created other couples other than Adam and Eve. Option number two, Adam and Eve had more children. The Bible talks about that all sin is a result of the fall, and the fall is a result of Adam and Eve. Therefore, we know because all mankind, all of us are born in sin, that option one holds no water. Adam and Eve were the first two and everyone were descendants from them. So from this, yes, this is where you do get, uh, it is his sister. It is his sister. And we do see, we're going to read um, on uh, next week, chapter five, verse four, Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. So we know this to be true. Um, Adam lived 930 years, 930 years. And God specifically says in Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply. In order to fulfill that, there was an element where it was a requirement that, that to fulfill that, incest did occur. Now, it's a totally different perspective today than it was then. It was in God's plan and it had to happen that way. The one thing to keep in mind from a gene pool perspective, the gene pool was 100% pure. Absolutely. Adam and Eve are the first two. So uh, the issues of incest are not as, as big of a deal then, but it is the reality. Same thing with Seth. We're going to see this in just a second. Seth had a son by his wife that had to have been his sister. Uh, it does, you know, it might give you some uh, heebie-jeebies about it, but the Bible does make it clear that incest is not okay. 
Leviticus uh, 20, verse 17, part of the law, it spells out that incest is wrong. Uh, we also see, are going to see in Genesis 12 and 20, uh, both are instances of Abraham saying that his wife is his sister to protect himself from being killed uh, out of uh, another man wanting his wife. Okay, so what this shows us, and I'll talk about this more when we get to 12 and 20, is that clearly it's not accepted practice for you to marry your sister. Otherwise, him saying that it's his sister wouldn't hold any water of uh, uh, confused people or in hiding the reality of that being his spouse. So there is no justification for incest in the Bible. It was an element that does exist and is there and had to happen at the very beginning for everybody to be descended from Adam and Eve. It's just an element of the reality of the situation. Then we see verse 19, Lamech had two wives, right? Why did he have two wives? Does this justify polygamy? Historical, cultural context. You need to understand in the patriarch patriarchal system that existed in that day. Women uh, were not considered equals. Women did not work. Women were not able to go and get jobs and provide for the family. Women were, unfortunately, the perspective was that their responsibility was simply to birth children. Uh, and unfortunately, their identity was in their husband. And unfortunately, um, it, it's just the, an element of their society is, is that unmarried women were often prostitutes. Uh, it went hand in hand, unfortunately. It's the reality. And so out of uh, protecting uh, a woman, uh, an unmarried woman was, would either end up uh, a slave, being taken into slavery because she had no husband, or would be made a prostitute. That's not across the board. But out of protection, men would take multiple wives. And we see that in the Bible. We see examples of this. Um, we, we're gonna talk about it with Jacob. Jacob had multiple wives uh, between Leah and um, Rachel. And it's not that we should practice polygamy today. Today, women are totally capable of being independent. In fact, they even very likely could do better by being independent from men. So that's one thing to keep in mind is, is that, that, that the polygamy that did exist uh, in the Old Testament times, there was an element of uh, safety and pr protection and provision uh, for women. The other thing is that uh, God's command uh, to be fruitful and multiply um, there is an element of having multiple wives allows for many, many kids to be had at different times. It does not condone, the Bible does not condone polygamy and the Bible does not condone incest. I just want to make that clear, even though those two things do exist uh, in Genesis 4. So now we get an interesting element. Verse 23 and 24, we have this little piece um, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. What is this all about? What context? The Bible, the Bible is the best commentary for the Bible. So uh, let's just break it apart. If Cain, so he says, Lamech tells his wives, I have killed a man who wounded me, a young man, for injuring me. We do not know what the young man did. Lamech is mentioned uh, in Genesis 5. We're going to see him, but it's a different Lamech. As far as this guy, we don't, we don't have any other context. We don't have any other explanation of, of what the wounding was. What did he do? But did it justify a death sentence? says that he wounded him, a young man injured him. Did it merit a death sentence? I would argue no, it, it, it doesn't because it wasn't a premeditated murder uh, that, that, that had been committed against him. It was just some sort of injury, a wounding. I don't know. But this is the line that's really interesting. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. What is Cain avenged? God says he puts his protection on him. 
Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. God puts a protection over Cain. Anybody who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. This is a bold, arrogant statement that Lamech is saying. He is saying that I have gotten away with murder, and if Cain is protected uh, and the vengeance that's brought for killing Cain is sevenfold, well, mine is 77. It is a very bold and arrogant statement that Lamech is, is saying, and he's boasting to his wives. It shows just in Cain's lineage, you see arrogance, you see pride, you see them follow the, the patriarch Cain. Continuing on, verse 25. Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. So these last two verses, these last two verses that we have, at this time, the very last one, at this time, people begin to call on the name of the Lord. We're going to see a comparison between the two brothers. Cain and Seth are two brothers. And we are going to see in chapter 5 the descendants of Seth and the similarity and the comparison between the descendants of Seth and the descendants of Cain. We see in Cain's descendants um, dissidence and pride and rebellion from God. And we're going to see in Seth's, uh, eventually it leads to, to Noah, and Noah's described specifically as um, walking faithfully with God. And we're going to see that next week. So this idea is that at that time people began to call on the name of the Lord is this idea that Seth and his lineage um, is a return to focusing on God from Cain's lineage. So questions to ponder. Uh, and I forgot to, to mention these in the previous three studies, but as I've done um, through uh, Romans, study questions. If you are doing this uh, on your own and you're either listening to this in the car or, or whatever, um, some questions to ponder just for yourself, or if you're doing this as a, a group study, uh, a discussion question for you to have. In Genesis 4.9, we see God ask the question, where is your brother? He asked Cain, where is your brother? In Genesis 3, 9, God asks Adam and Eve, where are you? Why? Why does God ask that question, where are you? What is the purpose of the questioning? And have you similarly been questioned by the Holy Spirit before? Why? Why was that? Lord, thank you. Thank you for uh, the story of Cain and the lessons that we can learn. Thank you for showing us um, Cain's heart, his jealousy, his anger. We do see that, Lord, today, um, everywhere we look. Lord, thank you also for Seth that we're going to see an example of uh, a more godly son. I pray, Lord, that um, we do not miss that opportunity, that when the Holy Spirit um, asks us that question of where you at, what's going on, that we would um, quickly uh, fall to our knees and admit the wrong that we have committed, whatever it is, no matter how small it is, and simply ask for your forgiveness and for you to come in and fill us from the inside out and change us. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you will um, put this message, whatever the message may be that you want to achieve, that your will will be done by it, and that those goals will be achieved uh, by this talk. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's it for this week. Uh, next week, we are going to hit um, Genesis chapter 5, where we are going to see the genealogy uh, that goes from Seth to Noah. And then chapter 6, we're going to talk all about the flood and uh, the wickedness of the world in the day of Noah. 
Uh, and one of the things that I am going to uh, talk about is the fact that um, our world is as in the days of Noah. Uh, and we'll talk about that. We have uh, that to look forward to in a couple weeks. So I love you guys and I'll see you next week.